Kicking off the list at number 10, Luigi Luceni. Back in the late 1800s, the Empress Elizabeth of Austria was sadly taken out by a man named Luigi Luceni. He wasn't a royal, he wasn't a long lost son, he wasn't hired help, nothing like that. He was just somebody who wanted to attack a royal. Any royal, for that matter, just didn't, no reason at all. He didn't have anything against Empress Elizabeth per se, but come September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level, but what had really happened that day was Luigi had intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans. But Luigi arrived too late in Geneva, and the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper then, saw Elizabeth, found out where she was staying, and then just waited for her to leave the hotel. Just like that. That is so scary. People are insane. That is just number 10. Number 9, Caligula. Of course we have to include Caligula on a list of evil lads. We've got to go back to ancient Rome for this one. We're turning the clocks back to 12 AD. The Roman Emperor Nero was already making headlines at this point. He was cruel as well. We'll talk about him later on. But then in comes Caligula to change the game in a weird and also cruel way. He loved spending money and showing off. He once had a two mile long boat, like a floating bridge, just so he could gallop back and forth on his horse. And then everyone was looking and they're like, oh great, cool, cool horse and cool bridge guy. We're all so hungry. He would also order his troops to do odd things, like go into the sea and collect as many seashells as possible. Like that's something you do if you're seven years old. You're like, I want all the seashells now. And they're like, you bet and they collect them. They're like, why do we, do we listen for hints? Why are we doing this? He then built a fancy house for his horse in Citadus. Yeah, not a dog house, not like a shed, like a fancy, rich palace. Why you ask? Well, because Caligula was on his way to appointing said horse into the high office. Yeah, Caligula was taken out sadly before this officially was completed, but he was very close to having his horse in the office of consul. Imagine losing your job to this guy's horse. Imagine the things he would have done. He was on route to do some bad stuff. What a weirdo. Number eight, Queen Ranavalona. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Ranavalona. One of the worst historically. She, was, uh, she had quite the temper, it seemed. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years in total. She's remembered as cruel, violent, and would often choose you know, violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she went mad with power almost instantly. In the late 1700s, King Andrian originally brought peace to the lands, but naturally there were traditionalists who opposed him. That's not new. That's, you know, we've seen every medieval show. There's people who aren't on board. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king beforehand. And that king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, Ranavalona, and now she had to marry his son, Prince Ranavalona. Now when said prince was alive, they didn't even get along. And come 1810, the king passed away, giving Ranavalona the promotion of a lifetime. But rumor has it, of course, is that Ranavalona poisoned the king. Just a rumor, but it is fitting as to what comes next. Ranavalona kept away the advances of the French and the British by leaving bodies of those who tried to attack prior out on display. Yeah, just sitting there on the beach, like some queen... Cersei type stuff, I don't know. This, I've been watching a lot of Game of Thrones recently, a lot of evil people. In 1845, Queen Ranavalona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months, this massive buffalo hunt, and well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation during this, and of course, exhaustion. And not one buffalo was even hunted. Just poor leadership and deaths, a lot of deaths. Number seven, Jolly Jane Toppin. Okay, getting a little more recent for this one. In the 1880s, Jane Toppin, AKA Jolly Jane, is now confessing to killing 31 people. And with that nickname and that many victims, yeah, I have to talk about her. Jolly Jane Toppin was a nurse working in Massachusetts. She would take care of the elderly, but instead of TLC, Jane would give them morphine and atropine. And to make things even more horrible, if such thing exists, Jane would lay next to her victim after she poisoned them and just would lie there while they were passing away. Yeah, evil, just evil and twisted, right? Just the worst thing ever. She managed to take the souls of 31 patients, but those numbers potentially reached the hundreds. She eventually and thankfully got caught and spent the remainder of her days lying alone in an asylum. Yeah, these killings began when she was younger after a boyfriend dumped her. That was the, the start of her mental decline, apparently. Number six, George Chapman. Going back to the late 1800s again for this guy. He began his career as a Polish doctor, but in 1888, he moved to London, and that's when things got a little dicey. Once he arrived in London, Chapman sought out four mistresses. Not three, not two, 
Four, despite already being married beforehand, which you probably could have predicted, George was a doctor, he was a cheater, and you could have guessed it by the title of this list, he was also a killer. He poisoned all four of those mistresses with arsenic. Chapman was also thankfully caught and later was executed for these horrible crimes in 1903. This guy was so bad, they actually thought perhaps this was Jack the Ripper, but that's been proven otherwise. Isn't that crazy? Like, oh, we thought you were this horrible person, but you're just your own unique horrible person. Nice. Now there's two of you. Horrible. Number five, Anna Ivanova. Anna Ivanova, the cruel ice princess, AKA the Empress of Russia back in 1730 to 1740. Where to begin? Okay, first of all, when you think ice princess, you want to put a magical spin on it, right? Cause that's all we know. Well, this was Russia in the 1700s. This was not a magical fun time. Not a Disney princess, that's for sure. To celebrate their victory over the Ottoman Empire, Anna Ivanova gave the order to build an ice house, sorry, <clears throat> an ice palace, rather, to celebrate the marriage of one of her maids and a prince. Sounds joyous almost, magical, one would say. Thing is, these guys didn't know each other prior to getting married, so that was weird as is, right? Can't forget that detail. They were complete strangers, but then they were forced to marry each other in a freezing cold palace literally made of ice in the dead of night. They had to ride an elephant as well as a newlywed couple. Or elephant. And all the guests, they were also forced to dress up like clowns for this entire party. So even if you weren't getting married, you were forced to be humiliated still. All in the name of said ice queen. Yeah, a little different than Frozen, I'd say. A little tiny bit different than Frozen. This Anna is not great. Number four, Nero. Yeah, we gotta mention Nero. If we're gonna talk smack about Caligula and his high horse, literally, we gotta include Nero. This was ancient Rome back in 68 CE. Nero Claudius Caesar Augustus Germanicus. He burned down Rome. That's that's pretty bad. That's memorable, I'd say. Dare I say, even more memorable than a horse palace. It's a messed up family, okay. Nero was heir of the Emperor Claudius, the fifth Roman emperor. He wiped out his entire family in horrible, different, unique ways, dare I say. And historically, it's believed that Nero lit the fire that burned down Rome. But he made it look like the Christians did. Once all was lost in the empire, Nero took his own life. Yeah, just all bad. Just bad leadership, bad Caligula and his horse, Nero, everything's burning. Rome was not pleasant. Not a pleasant time. Dead aqueducts and horrible history. Number three, H. H. Holmes. His fascination with medicine began at a young age. He used to perform fictional surgeries on his stuffed animals, always a red flag, awesome. H.H. went on to medical school and shortly after finishing, he began killing people in order to steal their property. He then built himself this massive, terrifying custom house that he had to build to include things like secret passages, trap doors, soundproof rooms, doors that locked from the outside with like gas jets on the inside. He even had a kiln to cremate his bodies. Is he the devil? I would say worse than the devil. I'd rather make a deal with the devil than meet H.H. H. Holmes any day, literally. Holmes gets close with women in order to take control of their finances and then later kill them, but he would also require his employees to fill out life insurance policies that named him as a beneficiary. Some of the bodies he even ended up selling to medical schools. How gross is that? Eventually, he was found out, nice, he was caught, and then sentenced, of course, to death. Not nearly enough times. It isn't exactly known how many victims he had, but it's thought to be somewhere over 200. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. The Hungarian noblewoman was every Everything but. Yeah, back in the late 16th century and even in the early 17th century, Elizabeth would meet young peasants and ask them to come work at her castle, right? This is a good day for peasants. She promised them a high paying job as a servant. That's a way better deal than being broke outside of the castle. So many times, if not all the time, these poor folk would come back with her. When they arrived to the castle, that's when things would change. That's when the tone would kind of shift. She would then brutally harm them. She would trap them, torture them, really just all the worst of the worst. And then finally, once she was bored or ready for the next house guest to arrive, she would finish them off. The number of fatalities here is somewhere around 80 peasants, but historically the number has also gone up to 600 in some accounts. So 80 to 600. Okay, come 1611, things changed. She was locked up in her own castle with barely any sunlight, nice. She was feeling the weight of her actions. Hopefully she was learning a few lessons here, but four years later in 1614, she passed away. Yeah, next to Vlad the Impaler, she's been a large inspiration behind Bram Stoker's Dracula. Yeah, that's... That's, that's bad, that's, that's really bad. Number one, Mao Zedong. Okay, getting into some pretty high numbers here. The dictator of China from 1943 to 1976, Mao Zedong. He had this vision one day that China would be the superpower, the super country, and in order to do so, he tried to reshape China's economy and turn it into an industrial one. From 1958 to 1962, the Great Leap Forward policy ended up leading to the deaths of around 45 million people. This makes the Great Chinese Famine the largest in human history. Again, this is also an estimate. The deaths were somewhere around 30 to 60 million. 
That feels like the number one to me. I don't know, I'd say that's the number one. Can't really rate evil and bad, but. Number 10, the eyeball man. Can anyone honestly say they aren't scared of this guy? The dude blacked out his eyeball, so he looked like a demonic Jack Skellington. More like Hack Skellington. Eyeball man's real name is Jason Barnum and is currently living out a 22 year sentence for an Alaska police officer. Barnum's crime was heavily influenced by a hefty addiction to chasing the dragon. Three officers were investigating vehicle break-ins and burglaries in South Anchorage and spotted a vehicle related to the attacks in a hotel parking lot. They checked out the security footage and saw a man carrying a tote to room 209. Barnum and two others were in the room and when officers entered the bathroom, the out began. Barnum was injured in the arm, but they arrested him when he got out of the hospital and they had to deal with how terrifying he looks, even though he's behind bars. So. Yeah. Number 9, Olga of Kiev. This one also feels like it's from Game of Thrones. Not much is known of the Ukrainian royal, but back in 903 AD, her ruling began. And history was never quite the same. Her husband was the soon to be Igor, ruler of the Kievan Rus. Come 945, the Dravillians prevailed and took out the king, leaving one Olga in charge. An angry, heartbroken Olga, that is. The Dravillians actually told Olga at this point to marry their own prince. They were adding insult to injury. How rude is that? So Olga said, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Send 20 men to talk about this arranged marriage and let's do it, let's get planning. You 20 go wait in the bathhouse and we'll talk shop soon. So when the men arrived, she then locked the doors on said bathhouse and then they never left. There's a lot of fire, really bad stuff. And that was just the beginning. Olga then invited 5,000 Dravillians over for a feast. Once everybody drank more than enough, she straight up wed redding her entire company. It was awful. This was the same lady who promoted Christianity in history. She was a literal saint. Historically, we refer to her as a saint. How crazy is that? I mean, you know, war history and stuff. Obviously, times are different, but like this, this is dark. To, to physically do that to that many people is dark. It's all dark. History is dark. Everyone's, everyone sucks. Number eight, King John of England. We've heard of Richard the Lionheart, but his brother, King John, not a pleasant fellow by any means. He was a pretty brutal king. He turned his back towards his family and friends and of course the country. His reign began in 1299 and by the time it ended in 1216, the country was screwed. It was pretty much bankrupt at that point. And that was the least of your concerns though if you knew King John personally. He had 12 illegitimate children, but afterwards he had all of their relatives and family taken out, just eliminated, just like that. If you looked at him the wrong way, you're going to jail. King John loved imprisoning people. He was so bad as a ruler that Robin Hood was actually inspired from his days of ruling. Yeah, we created myths to combat this maniacal ruler. He declared war against France. He stole from the church. He then ordered all clergy to leave. And in horrible historical fashion, Jewish people were also horribly singled out and they had all their belongings stolen and then they were then imprisoned or worse, brutally punished. All for nothing, all because this clown was born. Number seven, Commodus. We mentioned Nero and Caligula in part one, so why not dip our toes back in the ancient Roman waters again? Specifically, 180 AD. Commodus wasn't exactly the most evil per se, but he didn't pay attention while he was in the driver's seat. He let things slide, he let things go south. He was too busy modeling himself after Hercules. He also portrayed himself as Hercules. I guess that's important, that's how you want to be remembered. Sure, great, that's a one way to do it. But his love of the Roman games, that's where you start thinking, oh, something's up here. Maybe he is evil. Maybe he's actually quite evil all along. Who knew? Who would have thunk? He loved watching these Roman games so much that he finally entered himself. Yeah, he would just step in and brutally fight animals, humans, you name it. And then after it was done, he would charge the state a massive fee because, well, Commodus the mighty, holy Commodus, he made an appearance. And we're lucky, so now we should pay him. Okay, okay pal. He was so focused on how he wanted to be remembered in history that in 192 AD, he renamed Rome after himself. Yeah, and if that wasn't bad enough, he then changed all the 12 months to his 12 other names. A year later when he was, you know, taken out, all the names were changed back immediately. So he has no idea. No one tell him. Number six, King Henry VIII. Catherine Howard was the Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. That's such a, such a short amount of time, but why? What happened? Well, Catherine Howard was the fifth wife of one King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn. And he just gave her all the gifts. Just at 19 years old, here you go, everything you want, boom. 
It looked great at first, but their marriage only lasted one year. That's when rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, no, rumors started spreading about infidelity. And this is a medieval time, so there was little evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, but that didn't matter. We had a jealous king, so anything he says goes. You had me at fifth wife, you know? She was then executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green, February 13th, 1542. Number five, Linda Hazard. Cool last name, kind of tips you off a little bit. She's been dubbed as the starvation doctor because back in the day, the late 1800s that is, if you somehow ended up in the office of one Linda Hazard, well, it didn't really matter what you were suffering with. Linda's advice, her, sorry, medical advice for pretty much everything that came in was to fast. A broken leg? No problem, just skip lunch. See how you feel. Give it time. Just a bad doctor, which is bad on one hand, but more than 40 of her patients ended up dying due to, you know, starvation. Yeah, you could have guessed. She had her own sanitarium in Washington that was appropriately named Starvation Heights. Yeah, she wasn't even trying to hide it too. She's like, yeah, I'll call it this. You would think after like, I don't know, 16 deaths, people would start asking questions. No, this is a long time ago. This is before a lot of things came into play. Eventually, Hazard was caught, convicted, and served two years in prison. And then 26 years later, in 1938, she herself died of, you guessed it, starvation. Don't take your own advice, Linda. It's not, it's not great advice. Number four, Michael Swango. Going back to the 1980s for this one, kind of recent, okay? As a youngin, Michael Swango didn't play with Lego or Connects, my personal favorite. Instead, he would draw scenes of horrible crimes. Yeah, red flags, for sure. That went away for a bit when he grew up and got older, but when Michael later went to college, he decided to write his chemistry thesis on Georgi Markov. More specifically, he studied his horrific death caused by poison. Yeah, he was fascinated after that point. His newfound obsession was poisons and how many lives they took historically, like ancient Roman days. You know, really going back. Odd thing to study, but okay. During his third year at school, five patients that saw him ended up passing away afterwards. This happened often, it's happened more and more, but one individual luckily survived, and she remembered everything that happened. She remembered that Swango had injected her with something a minute before she started to experience seizures. He still got away with it somehow, but then later he went to another hospital in Ohio in 1984, and he handed out donuts that later made the staff feel sick. And then when they required treatment, he then Poisoned them. He got caught, was then sentenced to five years, but was released after two. He then changed his name, moved to Virginia, got a job as a career counselor, and then poisoned those co-workers as well. He got caught after doing this like three more times. Now he's finally serving three life sentences at ADX Supermax Federal Prison. It's hard to sum up in a minute or so with just how many things he's done and how many lives he's took. It's really bad, but I implore you to read more about him. The Poison Doctor. My gosh, I'm having nightmares tonight. Number three, Thomas Cream. Thomas Neil Cream, TNC, another Canadian monster. Originally, he graduated from McGill back in 1876, and after that, he traveled to London, England. This was during the time of the Industrial Revolution, so the demand for doctors here was extremely high. Thomas was there for business, and apparently he was there for pleasure. He enjoyed London's nightlife a lot. He would dance, drink, hook up with strangers, just, you know, all the things you don't want your medical doctor doing, just mere hours before a shift. But on November 15th, 1892, there were thousands gathered outside the Newgate prison walls, eagerly awaiting the execution of one Dr. Thomas Cream. Well, now he's referred to as the Lambeth Poisoner. If you had the misfortune of seeing this doctor as well, odds are he too would have tried to poison you. Just because. Yeah, poison doctors. How common are these guys? He actually did get caught once. He was convicted of poisoning a woman. He was given life in prison, but apparently it's all about who you know. His brother bribed the governor of Illinois, so he poisoned five more people in London before eventually getting arrested again, and then finally executed, this time for a crowd. Number two, Elizabeth Wettlaufer. The scariest people are the ones who abuse their power. I mean, doctors, evidently. I mean, historically, there have been some pretty evil ones. Elizabeth Wettlaufer is one of the worst, hands down. She was once a nurse at not one, but several long-term care facilities in Southern Ontario. Really and close to home with this one. Elizabeth would use doses of insulin on their patients, that was her discreet way of taking lives, but it gets even worse, dare I say, if you can believe that. After the patient had passed away, Elizabeth would then steal their belongings. In 2016, she quit her nursing job and then checked herself into a psychiatric hospital and confessed to all of her crimes. Those being eight counts of first degree, four counts of attempted, and two counts of aggravated assault. Absolutely brutal. These happened from 2007 to 2016 in Woodstock, Ontario. Yeah, Woodstock of all places. Elizabeth is now in her late 50s serving eight concurrent life sentences, but after 25 years, thanks to Canadian law, she gets a chance at parole. Scary, huh? Yep, I'd agree. And finally, number one, 
Queen Isabella of Spain. Look, we got pretty dark on this list, so we'll, you know, we'll peel back the layers of unholiness for our last one here. We'll go to the 15th century. We'll go to Queen Isabella of Spain. She once ruled with King Ferdinand II for a while. She ruled from 1451 to 1504. While in power, she forced Catholicism upon all. Yeah, if you were Jewish, you had to attend the Spanish court and then convert, and if not, the queen tossed you up. Horrible stuff. Recently, however, there have been a few calls to have her monuments removed from Canadian parks. At McDonald's Park, for example, a monument has been up since 1958, and it's to honor the Queen's role in Columbus's arrival to the Americas. There's even a street named right after her, right across from the monument. Locals want all of it removed and or changed because, you know, they're not fans of genocide. These changes are actively being made throughout Canada right now, which is nice to see. Ryerson University recently changed its name to Toronto Metropolitan University because of Edgerton Ryerson's previous ties with Canadian residential schools. So it's happening. Slowly but surely, changes are happening. Starting off this countdown, we have Richard Matt. Matt's career as a criminal started off when he was young. He was involved in robberies, kidnappings, and then eventually murder. The first murder he committed was of his former boss. He then fled to Mexico to avoid being caught. While there, he murdered a second man while attempting to rob him. In 2007, he was convicted for the murders and began serving a 25 year to life sentence. But guess what? 2015, he actually escaped the facility with a fellow inmate, and they spent 20 days on the run before getting re caught. And apparently, he has a history of jailbreaks. So I don't know why they just didn't pay closer attention to him. In the end, this was his final escape since he was caught and killed by border patrol while trying to flee to Canada. Number nine, Eric R. Rudolph. Resourceful and resilient, Eric R. Rudolph quickly got on America's most wanted list. Why? Well, during 1996 to 1998, Eric detonated bombs four times in Atlanta and Birmingham, taking the lives of two people and injuring thousands. A five year manhunt ensued. He was finally caught in May 2003 after he was found rummaging through a dumpster. Later, it was revealed how intense his survival skills were. For five years, Eric foraged off the lands and survived off of buried barrels of grain and soy. He learned the schedules of when produce was going to be thrown out at grocery stores and stole what he could where it wouldn't be noticed. His motivation behind the was a compilation of radical anti-gay, anti-abortion, and anti-government. The list goes on. He didn't get along with other people, and when he confessed to his crimes, he showed no remorse. But when he was taken away to go to prison, authorities report that the man had tears in his eyes, knowing he was utterly defeated. What can I say, man? Your actions brought you to where you are now, so sorry about it. Sorry, not sorry. Number eight, Robert P. Hansen. The man the FBI was afraid of, and he was right under their noses. Joining them for lunch in the cafe, grabbing coffee with them, laughing at the cooler. But all the while, Robert P. Hansen was a mole. On February 18th, 2001, Robert was arrested and charged with committing espionage on behalf of intelligence services for the former Soviet Union and their successors. He was caught red handed placing a package containing highly classified information at a park in Vienna, Virginia for his Russian handlers. When the FBI searched his apartment, it became apparent his payment was in cash and diamonds with the value of over $600,000. Hansen handed over dozens of delicate files, including FBI counterintelligence investigative techniques, sources, methods, operations. He exposed the FBI's secret investigation of Felix Block, a foreign service officer for espionage. He pled guilty to 15 accounts of espionage on July 6, 2001 and was sentenced to prison without the possibility of parole. He is considered the most dangerous spy in FBI. FBI history. God knows what he said. Number seven, David Carpenter. I know Lisa Rena from Dancing with the Stars because I love a good foxtrot. Love it. But she's actually more well known for being a desperate housewife. But it turns out that her very own mother was actually David Carpenter's first victim. She knew him from work and he offered to give her a ride home and he had kids and a wife. Soon he was on top of her, hammer and knife in hand, but thankfully a cop was nearby who suspected something was amiss, so she was saved. David was sentenced to 14 years in prison where he was diagnosed as a sociopath with a very high IQ. He was released after only 9 years and quickly went on to commit more attacks against women. Good call on releasing him. Just saying? Like what? Ugh. I hate that. I hate that. At one time, he was even suspected of being the Zodiac Killer, and said he became known as the trailside killer who would prey on women on hiking trails. He took the lives of 10 people, though it's probable that there were more. Just two survived, and officers described that he was a kind of 
Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of behavior. He was super nice, but then he had this insane psycho creepy dark side as well. Number six, Zacharias Musawi. The ADX prison is intended as a holding cell to teach prisoners proper conduct before they are sent to penitentiaries. However, some are so bad that they are never released for fear they might inspire new crimes if allowed to communicate to those outside the walls. Zacharias is one of them. He is currently serving out six life sentences for assisting the hijackers who carried out the, you guessed it, the attacks on the World Trade Center. Musawi was placed on a watch list in 1999 and he started interacting with Islamist extremists. He could have prevented the attacks entirely, however he lied to the FBI about the Al Qaeda and their plans to attack the US. He was even supposed to pilot a plane into the White House. He was arrested in August 2001 and went on trial in 2006. Throughout the trial he praised the Al Qaeda and was removed for several outbursts. A very different tone to the note he wrote recently in 2020 renouncing Al Qaeda and appealed to younger Muslims to be wary of their deceptive ways. I really do hope he has genuinely released those ideals, however he did do it in an attempt to relax his sentence. As recently as 2018 he was still referring to himself as a natural born so needless to say I don't see things relaxing anytime soon. Number 5 The Marathon Jahar Sarnayev. Speaking of the ADX prison, there is yet another permanent resident behind its walls. Jahar Sarnayev is responsible for the 2013 Boston Marathon which took the lives of three people and injured 250 people in the large crowd. This event shook the world and I remember when it happened. I remember checking my phone repeatedly in order to figure out what's happening and follow with updates. And I'm sure a lot of you do too. He and his brother Tamerlane used two pressure cookers packed with explosives and shrapnel. His brother was shot during a police chase while Jahar was taken into custody. He was 19 when he committed the crime and 21 when he was finally tried. The trial consisted of heartbreaking testimonies from families of the injured and the dead. The death penalty was disbanded in Boston for decades, but it was considered for this case as it was a federal case. He was instead given his life sentence to be served out in solitary confinement with no opportunities to communicate with the outside world, and that is probably how it's going to remain for the rest of his life. Wow, so young. Number 4 The Nathari Killers The Nathari crimes came to light on December 29, 2006 after 8 skeletal remains of young bodies were found in the drain of a house in Nathari Noida. The owner of the house and the businessman Mohinder Singh Pander and the domestic help Surinder Kohli were arrested. Soon after they were found, even more bodies turned up. The village had been making noise about the disappearances for a while before anything was done, but now the Nathari killers remain some of the most horrific people behind bars. Over 16 young people fell victim to kidnapping, vicious bodily violations and death, which believed to have occurred between 2005 to 2006. Both men have been found guilty and the death penalty is in discussion, though has been delayed. Some believe that there is money involved in the case that may result in an unfair result, but considering the severity of the case, release is not really on the table. I'm not going to lie, it was hard to get a straight story on this, there is a lot of convoluted details across the articles I could find, so if you have more info you want to share, drop it down below. Number 3 Larry Hoover This dude is so powerful that he was continuing to run his operation while serving out a 200 year sentence for murder. Larry Hoover was slash is I suppose the chairman of the notorious gangster disciples gang. He was convicted 2 decades ago of continuing to run his empire behind bars. Hoover now 70 is serving out 6 life sentences at the supermax federal prison in Florence, Colorado. A facility that holds the worst of the worst. Terrorists, mobsters, anyone who would be a danger to anyone from the outside. It is said to be the most secure in the country. He established the gang in Chicago in the 1960s and has recently decided to try and take some of them down. The indictment accused seven state and national leaders of the gangster disciples of racketeering conspiracy, drug trafficking, witness intimidation and multiple murders including the 2018 death of a 65 year old ranking member of the gang on Chicago's south side. Beware if you've ever crossed Larry Hoover because even behind bars? You can't stop him. Number two, James Marcello. I honestly sound like I'm in a 1940s film noir when I was researching this. You'll see why in a second. He is the highest ranking Chicago mob boss in prison, also known as Jimmy the Man Marcello. Now at the age of 76, he filed a petition in June 2020 to have his sentence tossed out. Jimmy was one of five top criminals who were convicted of the 2007 Family Secrets racketeering case. He was convicted of taking the lives of Tony the Ants Belotro and his brother Michael. They were found 
in a cornfield in June 1986 after being beaten and strangled to death in Jimmy's basement. He was sentenced to life in prison in 2009 and currently resides at the Supermax facility in Colorado just like Mr. Hoover. Marcelo's father was also in the biz and so was his big brother, Big Mickey. The family had influence. There were crimes that hit the news and crimes no one knows about. Either way, now Jimmy wants out. He's like, ah, come on, give an old guy a break. Not for you, Jimmy. Not for you. And last but not least, Monstrous Mugsley. Whew. When I started reading about this guy, I literally had to step away from my desk. It, ugh, there were some images I just didn't want to read, but here we are. Meet the man so dangerous that he is now kept in a below ground glass box in complete isolation. Not only did he take lives outside of prison, but inside of it, he was the man everyone feared. The point that made me turn away was what he did with a spoon, which dubbed him the nickname of Hannibal the Cannibal. Robert Mugsley has been locked away in a glass box just like the infamous villain for over 40 years. He was sentenced to life in prison after taking the lives of four people. His crimes were so violent, the cops nicknamed him Blue because that was the color of the first victim. But his crimes did not end behind bars. He brutalized and took the lives of abusers of young victims behind bars in vicious and terrifying ways, just like you would predict people would do in prison. He was so volatile and like laissez faire about it that the only thing the prison thought to do about it was build him his own cage. He is allowed one hour of exercise a day. His childhood was riddled with abuse and he would often take most of it to protect his siblings. This violent childhood along with his extreme intelligence resulted in a violent appetite. However, after 40 years of psychiatry, appeals are being made to improve his well-being. Honestly, he did some awful stuff. If there is even a way out of the dark for even the worst and the worst of us, then it should be at least attempted. That's my mentality of it, but man, oof, creepy. Number 10. Abigail Williams. I'm putting Abigail Williams on this list because the whole ordeal just makes me so mad. By claiming that she was bewitched, she sparked a massive witch hunt, literally one of the most illogical points in history, leading to the most unnecessary deaths of so many people. Ugh, I hate her. I can't even watch a production of The Crucible without needing to break stuff after. It makes me so mad. Look, I don't know whether her claims were true that she and the other girls were afflicted because of witchcraft or the more likely latter event of them eating an infected piece of grain. Maybe, maybe that happened, but I'll let you decide. Abigail Williams was living with her uncle, Reverend Samuel Paris, and started practicing mild witchcraft with his daughter and Tatuba and John Indian, his slaves. You know the kind of witchcraft where you drop an egg in the water and see the name of your future husband or I don't know, like where you're gonna go tomorrow, that kind of stuff. Apparently they saw a coffin in the glass and that freaked them out. So they started acting weird. Other girls followed suit. Keep in mind they were around 11 or 12. So, all right, imagination. And then Abigail just kept accusing people like all the time. And if you admitted you were a witch, you were pardoned. And if you didn't, you were killed, okay? So technically she was never in prison but she put a lot of people there on bullshit and then they claimed possession to get out. So I say that this deserves to be number 10. Yep, there it is. In our ninth spot, we have the dating game killer. This dude gets his name because while police were looking for him, he appeared on TV for an episode of the dating game in 1978. He did this in the midst of his murder spree. In fact, the dater on the show actually chose him, but when they met afterwards, she said that she got a bad feeling around him and they never actually went on a date, which that was a close call for her. Because during his appearance on the show, he had already murdered at least five women. His date would have probably been his next victim. This killer would often toy with his victims. He would strangle them until they lost consciousness, then he would revive them, and then repeat this process several times before taking their lives. In the end, he was convicted of murdering five women, but police think that his kill count is much, much higher. In our eighth spot, we have the razor blade. This story comes from a prisoner who was locked away in a Texas prison. The prisoner told the story of a fellow inmate who everyone feared. It was this woman who would violently lash out on her fellow inmates. One time she even put a razor blade in a bar of soap and would use it to cut up other prisoners. When the guards found them, there was blood everywhere. 
So yeah, I can see why people fear her. I wouldn't want to get on her bad side, let alone even look at her. Moving on to number seven, we have Ronnie McPeters. One of the scariest inmates in the world is said to be Ronnie McPeters. Roddy was sent to jail for the murder of a 27 year old woman in 1984. The woman, Linda Marie Baltazar, was running errands when Ronnie came up to her window panhandling. She shooed him away and he left, but then he ended up coming back, this time armed. He then shot her five times. As a result, he was arrested and sent to Fresno jail. But his bad behavior never stopped. While in jail, he would set fires, attack other prisoners, and even sometimes would, you know, smear his feces on the walls and floors and sometimes all over his body. Now, he was actually put on death row for his crimes, but he was deemed, and I quote, too insane to be executed. In our sixth spot, we have Joanna Danahy. Joanna is a serial killer who, in March of 2013, went on a 10 day killing spree. She murdered three men, but her goal was to murder nine. She said she wanted to be like the killers, Bonnie and Clyde. After killing the men, she would throw their bodies in ditches. In fact, she has the title of one of Britain's most notorious female murderers. While in prison, Joanna has made it a point to prove to other serial killers that she is the best killer among them. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the inmate from hell. So, this story comes from a nurse who worked at a prison. She shared the story of the scariest inmate that she has ever encountered. This inmate would go around biting officers in their arms and shoulders. He would headbutt them as well as even punch them directly in the face. He has broken people's bones and even ripped out chunks of flesh off of them with his teeth. Yeah, that must have been terrifying to see, like what the heck? Moving on to number four, we have Pascal Payet. Pascal Payet is a French criminal who was sent to jail for committing a murder during a robbery in 1997. But he is famous for his daring prison escapes. In 2001, this dude managed to escape prison using a hijacked helicopter. But he didn't perform the stunt just once. No, no, he escaped twice. So obviously, he was caught and then sent back to jail. Then in 2007, he did it again. It only took him five minutes. Within that time frame, four masked men hijacked a helicopter and took the pilot hostage. They then landed on the roof of the prison and used some device to open the doors and get Pascal out of his cell. Like I said, they were in and out within five minutes. Two days after this escape, an arrest warrant was issued against him. Nowadays, he is never kept at the same prison for more than six months, and he is placed in solitary confinement where he is under high surveillance. They don't want him escaping for a third time. In our third spot, we have Damien Folks. All right, folks, let's talk about Damien Folks. See what I did there? Anyways, this guy, don't get me started. So, this guy was serving a life in term in jail for armed robbery. While in jail, he attacked a number of prisoners. He strangled killer Colin Hatch with strips of bedding and also slashed the throat of Soham murderer Ian Huntley. And this is what he had to say to that. He said, I hope I killed him. I've been planning it for weeks. Now, Ian Huntley did survive, but he had a seven inch wound that just missed his juggler vein. But that's why Damien is considered incredibly dangerous. In our second spot, we have Mark Hobson. Mark Hobson went on a killing spree in North Yorkshire, England in 2004. As a result, he took the lives of four people. But he was also involved in a nationwide manhunt, which involved more than 500 police officers and 12 police forces all looking for him. During that time, he was considered Britain's most wanted man. And this is another dude that is not afraid to get violent with others. In September of 2005, he poured a bucket of boiling water over a fellow killer. And on a number of other occasions, he has attacked other prisoners. As a result, he is another prisoner who is kept under close surveillance at all times. And in our number one spot today, we have Robert Maudsley. Robert Maudsley has actually been named Britain's most dangerous prisoner. Now you might be wondering, Lindsay, why is that? Well, oh boy, let me tell you. In 1977, Maudsley and his fellow inmates held another prisoner hostage. They tortured him for nine hours before cracking his head open and killing him. And rumor has it that he even ate some of the prisoner's brain. As a result, he was deemed the real life Hannibal Lecter. A couple months later, he murdered two other inmates, then casually told the prison officer that during the next roll call, he would be too short. As a result, he's actually kept in an isolated glass cell so guards can see what he's up to at all times. They don't want another hostage situation to occur ever again. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
Ivan the Terrible. If his name didn't already give you a hint here, Ivan the Terrible was not a great lad. He was rather terrible. His Russian nickname translates to more than evil, so I figured who better to kick off this dark list with than this lad. The first Tsar of Russia back in the mid 1500s. Okay, he created Russia's secret police. Ivan IV enjoyed harming members of nobility and he did so in cruel ways. A ray of sunshine appeared in 1564. Ivan the Terrible officially resigned. And then a year later, however, he immediately came back, so yeah. And then he took control of one third of the Muscovite realms. Not a retirement at all. Right back up on that ruling evil horse, I guess. And then in 1581, he took out his heir to the throne, literally like a Game of Thrones villain. So yeah, he's evil to all those around him and his own family. Number nine, Luis Zambrano. Luis was a man from Queens who took the life of his ex-girlfriend, Angie Escobar, in her Whitestone home. She was just 28 years old and had just broken up with him when he violently attacked her, inflicting 80 wounds with a pair of scissors. But he didn't just claim that he was heartbroken, no. The reason he killed her was because of one, trust issues, that's a given, she's an ex for a reason, and two, you guessed it, demonic possession. A quote from Luis reads, quote, if you believe in demonic possession, you know I was under the influence of drugs and alcohol. I barely remember what happened, unquote, he said. Dude, it caught you, just fess up, man. The devil doesn't just conveniently show up when you do something really awful, okay? He's busy building the next Apple update and creating pop-up ads, okay? Thankfully, the court saw right through him and sentenced San Breno to 26.5 years in prison. Game over, Satan. Number eight, Edder Guzman Rodriguez. In Virginia back in 2011, Rodriguez performed a violent exorcism if you can even call it that, on his very young daughter. He attempted to rid her of the demon he believed was inside her, and it ended up costing her her life. When police arrived at the scene, several people were holding Bibles outside their home. Edder stated that while he took his daughter's life, he too was also possessed by a bad spirit. Yeah, it's called being an awful human being. Look it up. The girl was found on a bed, wrapped in a blanket, surrounded by Bibles. Guzman had also knocked his wife unconscious so she wouldn't be able to stop the exorcism. To this day, he stands by his claim while also admitting to the crime. Guzman was sentenced to 20 years and 11 months in prison. Number seven, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer. Man, I hate how this guy is on every list, but here he is again. An interview was released that Rader believed it was a demon that pushed him to take the lives of those 10 people. By now, if you follow our channel or are a true crime fan, you know what BTK stands for. And if you don't, Google it because YouTube won't let me say it. Radar was a very religious man and was a leader in his community, but despite his connection to godliness, Radar confessed that he believes a demon entered him when he was a young boy. How convenient, as that's when he started to notice his dark side. He told Larry Hatberg during an interview and I quote, how could a guy like me, a church member, raise a family, go out and do those sorts of things, he said. Quote, I personally think, and I know it's not very Christian, but I actually think it's a demon that's within me, unquote. or you're just an awful human being saying it together. That's great. Let's move on. Number six, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam. The son of Sam terrorized NYC for a period in the 1970s and was finally caught in 1977. He would carry out what appeared to be random shootings, claiming six lives, wounding seven more with a .44 caliber revolver. David frequented lovers' lanes and women even went to salons to rid themselves of brown hair so they wouldn't be targets because they thought that was his thing. Alongside the crimes, postal worker turned shooter blamed his actions on his neighbor's dog, who he said was actually possessed by a 6,000 year old demon. Apparently his name was Harvey and Berkowitz was simply following his instructions. Number five, Pazazu Algarid. Now this one is a little freaky because one of the people who lived in the same building as Pazazu swore he was possessed. The name Pazazu is actually the name of the demon mentioned in the film, The Exorcist. Pazazu was arrested after authorities discovered a dead body in his backyard, along with another that he helped his wife bury a year prior. If there's anyone on this list that could actually have been possessed, then it might have been this guy, maybe number one. He was a satanic fanatic and even went so far as to fork his own tongue and saw his teeth 
razor sharp. Ugh. An anonymous quote from the man who lived with Pizzazzo said, quote, it was very serpentine and his eyes would kind of get a little like glazy, like almost not there. Like the inner part of him would kind of phase away. You could tell when his demons needed something from him because they took over, unquote. Ugh. Also important to note that the house that he lived in was so gross, it was deemed unsafe for human life. There was filth, human and not everywhere, demonic and evil symbols on the walls. Ugh, yeah, not a place you'd want to find yourself, especially since the man who lived there might have been the demon Pazazu himself. Number four, Michael Taylor. I swear there was something about the 70s that just like bred crazy wacko serial killers. Like anyone else feel that way? Were they just there all along when we finally started to notice? I don't know, but we have yet another serial killer on our list who also claimed possession. Even before he violently took his wife's life, Taylor suspected that he was possessed by a demonic spirit. He was a simple butcher living in Osset, England, who was suddenly overcome by a darkness he couldn't explain. He underwent an overnight exorcism performed on him on October 5th, 6th in 1974, and though it reportedly worked, some of the demons, yes, plural, kept hanging on. According to someone involved, they invoked and cast out at least 40 demons, though three remained. They were pretty bad. After he returned home, he viciously took the life of his wife, removing her eyes and tongue, most of her skin from her face, and took their pet's life as well. When police found Taylor, he was standing in the street, covered in blood, yelling, quote, it is the blood of Satan, unquote. I don't know what to believe about that one. Demonic possession doesn't seem like an afterthought here, whereas it does with the other ones, so what do you think, guys? Number three, Deborah and Adolfo Gomez. Okay, whether for five minutes or 10 years, we all believed at some point that the prophecy about 2012 being the end of the world was true. But it appears no one believed as hard as Deborah and Adolfo Gomez, who were not only convinced that 2012 was the end of the world, but that their house was possessed by a demon. Yeah. The couple was arrested after restraining their children with duct tape in their SUV because they also were demon possessed. Apparently they would often cover their eyes and mouths with duct tape in order to keep the demons out. Oh my God. When police finally caught up with them in Lawrence, Kansas, they also discovered that Adolfo hadn't slept for nine days. How that happened, we don't know, but it may explain why he thought he was possessed. Sleep deprivation can cause some serious harm. The longest anyone has ever gone without it, I think was 11 days. And after just four or five days of no sleep, people start to hallucinate. So maybe that's the reason. Number two, Aljar Schwartz. In 2013, Aljar Schwartz from South Africa claimed he had become possessed by vague satanic attacks. Of course. He wouldn't be on this list if he didn't. This was verified by Reverend Cecil Begbie and confirmed that this was the cause for Schwartz's crime. He strangled and then beheaded his victim in an abandoned school in October of that year. Oh my God. Reports say that Aljar planned on selling the head to a traditional healer. He was caught and incarcerated, however, but his community stood behind him, weirdly. Reverend Begbie instructed church groups across Africa to pray for Schwartz on the Good Friday following his arrest. Schwartz reportedly felt like pure water was washing over him at the time of the prayer and now claims the demons are no longer in possession of him. This, however, will not mitigate his sentence. And lastly, number one, Arn Cheyenne Johnson. Johnson sparked controversy far and wide in a case that became known as the Devil Made Me Do It case. In 1981, 19-year-old Arn Cheyenne Johnson was arguing with Alan Bono over Johnson's girlfriend when Arn stabbed Bono to death. When authorities arrived, you can guess what Johnson said, the devil made me do it hence the title of the case. So you'd expect the officer to be like, nah, nah, whatever, buddy, keep on walking. But no, there is a reason this case is in our number one spot. Every paranormal investigator worth their salt, including the beloved, Ed and Lorraine Warren flocked to Connecticut to interview him. But the Warrens were there to defend him because they already knew him. The Warrens told police that in July, 1980, Johnson had participated in at least three exorcisms involving his girlfriend's 11 year old brother, David. He reportedly was host of 43 demons. The Warrens stated that at the time of the exorcism, and I quote, Johnson leaped up and cried to the demon, come into me, I'll fight you, come into me. From that time on, he was possessed. 
quote. The paranormal society was split in two, but Johnson's team was committed. The court had defended accounts of God in the past. Now it was time to defend accounts of the devil. But despite what you may believe, it wasn't enough and Johnson received maximum sentence, but was released after good behavior just four years later. I love that this list started as Rachel complaining about the crucible and then went from the totally unbelievable to the absolutely unexplainable. Like, ugh.